right, good evening, everyone. Welcome, I'm Anthony Monta, the Assistant Director for Academics at the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Welcome to the long-awaited cage match between Fyodor Dostoevsky and some obscure composer from Vienna who wrote this opera out of the marriage of Figaro. <laughs> we, have, we are delighted tonight, though, to, uh, to bring something really, really special here. The Nanovic Institute, as you know, has a, has a film series every semester. The film series uh, typically has a theme. The theme this year was uh, the best of recent European film. We just wanted to scoop up some of the most interesting films that, uh, that we know of. We have a bunch of faculty participating and, and feeding us information about this. Uh, we go to the Toronto International Film Festival. We connect ourselves as best we can to the best uh, in European film. This semester, or this year actually, we had uh, Mic Max, directed by Jean-Pierre Genet, who you may recall directed Amélie. We had uh, Paris, a film uh, directed by Cédric Clapiche, also from France. Seraphine, which was um, a film by Martin Provost. All of these films were part of a, um, also a French tournée of films that came, that we were able to bring to Notre Dame through a partnership with the French Cultural Services. Then we showed a, a wonderful film called The Man from London by a Hungarian director named Bela Tarr. Uh, Katyn, about the massacre in the Katyn Forest by the great Polish director Anders Weide, which was devastating. Uh, and most recently, The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, who was, you younger folks would know that that's Heath Ledger's last film um, by Terry Gilliam. Tonight, to wrap up the series, we have a great pleasure of introducing to you uh, Petra Zelenka, who has directed this, this film you're about to see, Karamazovi, which is an adaptation of this, this long, you know, long neglected work by Dostoevsky. Zelenka was born in 67 in Prague. In 1991, he graduated from the script writing department at the Film and TV School of the Academy of the Performing Arts there. His first work was entitled The New Religion of Kurt Vonnegut a play which was published in 1992. So he has some interest in, it, uh, in American literature. His first film was called Padlock and took as its subject a punk rock band, beginning a long-standing interest in musicians and music. In the 90s, he worked as a script editor, playwright, and director of theater and film in the Czech Republic. And four of his original television screenplays were produced by Czech television. From 96 to 2002, his screenplays and productions have won numerous awards most notably Butner's 1997, his second feature film, which has become a major Czech cult film and won a slew of film festival awards around uh, internationally. He's now considered at the forefront of new Czech cinema, which we had a lively conversation about uh, over dinner. He's gone on to do much more uh, interesting and, and award-winning work. 2002, The Year of the Devil, a fictional documentary with musicians acting as themselves, among them a folk music band that's a favorite of Václav Havel's. It won six Czech Lion Awards and several international prizes. In 2004, his Tales of Common Insanity, an award-winning play that he wrote while working with Prague's uh, Davica Theater, went on to be staged in Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Germany. It has now been published in English and Russian. In 2005, that was adapted as a film, released as Wrong Side Up, which won two movie festival awards and nominated for six others. And in 2008, Karamazovi, which is the film you'll see tonight, which he wrote and directed, was the Czech Republic's official Oscar submission and won the International Federation of Film Critics Award in 2008. So, you are in for a treat. I'm very happy to present to you one of the rising stars of contemporary Czech cinema, Petra Zelenka. Hello. Of course, you've never heard of any of these films that, uh, uh, that were mentioned here, but it's okay because the world is uh, not uh, global. So uh, I hope you like this film. I'll be, I'll be happy to talk to you after the film, after the screening, to do some Q&As, if you like, and, um, and get ready for a lot of reading, but also ho I hope for some passion and, and uh, music and acting.
if there are any questions, Director Peter Petrozanka would be glad to answer, answer them. And those of you who don't want to be here, you can leave, of course. <laughs> I know it's harsh to do Q and A's just right after the film, because we, first we we hold that you you'll be left with some impact from the film, and and still you'll be able to ask questions. But no. was it was it heavy? Or? actually blending film with theater. And uh, I tend to think that there is an almost unbridgeable gap between these two domains of what used to be actually a common stock visual arts in this specific country. Filmmakers basically don't you know, uh, direct plays you know, in theaters. Uh, directors of uh, plays basically rarely venture into Hollywood. So my general question basically would be, um, what is your definition or what would you like to tell us today at the beginning of the 21st century about the relationship between theatrical form and then cinema form? Taking into account this movie you just actually showed us. Well, I think for me in, in general, uh, film is just a, a part of theater. Like, Theatre for me is, is much wider concept of of, uh, of achieving uh, uh, catharsis, and the film is just one kind of theatre, very flat and uh, with more specific rules. So I don't think there's a film and theatre. I think film is film is one kind of that theatrical uh, portrayal of, of life. What I was trying to do here in, uh, in terms of writing, I was trying to combine uh, psychological storytelling with the Greek tragedy. Because uh, I, wa I wanted to put something in it that would sort of correspond with Dostoevsky, but we didn't have much time, because I, I know that I can't leave the Dostoevsky story for a long time. I, I have to be with Dostoevsky all the time. I can do only small detours from Brothers Karamazovs. So, so I ended up with a really very simple Greek tragedy story, you know. The, the child dies, the father dies because he has to. There's, it's, it's sort of fate. And we don't question that. That's, uh, that's from the very beginning, you know it's going to happen. So, so it's it's also like it's not only film and theater. It's for me, it's also two kinds of theater here. It's a, a Greek drama and modern drama, but it's a, it's a very sophisticated way to look at it. So. Yeah. Well, uh, I have to, I have to say that I've seen a wonderful film uh, uh, by Louis Louis Malle. You probably know it. It's called Vanya on Forty Second Street, and it's about a group of actors who play Uncle Vanya by Chekhov in a rundown theater on, in New York in 42nd Street. Uh, the place is no longer there, it's, it's gone. But uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a film from, uh, from the mid-90s. There's not much uh, else except, except Chekhov there. There's also some uh, audience, but uh, it's a rehearsal, and they, you basically see the Chekhov's play. And it was rewritten by David Mamet. And, uh, I was inspired by that also. But, uh, but you're right, this, this sort of filmmaking is not welcome today. And, and Vanya on 42nd Street wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be made today. And I was told by various filmmakers, that they said, if, if you made this film in the 60s, you, it would be great, you know, it would be famous. Because <laughs> <laughs> today's culture, uh, 
is not very fond of self-reflected, uh, self-reflective self uh, art. You know, I don't know why, but uh, it's not uh, it's not fashionable. Why exactly you decided to choose this particular setting for Yes, yes. Well, it, uh, I, I was looking for a very realistic set, for, for something very real, as a juxtaposition to, to stage. And I, and I knew um, I would be very limited in, uh, in terms of pictures or in terms of framing, or because I'll, I'll be showing talking people. That, that I knew that from the beginning, so I thought we have to put it somewhere, we have to stage it somewhere where the, where the set is a character of, as, as such. And uh, then, I <clears throat> then I got to know about the, the history of Nova Huta. Uh, this is not Nova Huta really, this is a different steel factory, but it makes no difference. But the history of Nova Huta as a, as a place without God a place that had to that was uh, designed as a big steel factory in Krakow or outside Krakow to destroy Krakow intelligentsia. So I like I liked the idea. You know, so I, I thought it fits into Dostoevsky also, and it was really the real thing. You know, it was uh, they stopped the production during the day because of us, and uh, and everything was really heavy. You know. From time to time, I would ask prop people to, to move this and that, and they said, I cannot move it. We cannot move it. It weighs a couple of tons, you know. So we had to use their cranes to move the stuff around, you know. And uh, it was funny, they, they, they're using the electromagnets uh, cranes, so they would, they would uh, simply stuck the, the hook on, on something, and it would be stuck there because it's, it's a magnet, you know. And once, once the electricity fell off, the electricity was disconnected, and all the objects fell down, because it works only when there's electricity, these electromagnets. You know. And it was like you know, a couple of tons, heavy objects falling down all around you. you know. Well, you thought, well, this, the helmets wouldn't help you know, in this case. <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah, it happens, you know, guys. You know, sometimes you were lucky nobody got hurt. But so well, I w we were looking for some something real. So that's that's the answer. And, uh, and I've seen I've seen Hamlet uh, being done in, in Polish stockyards, uh, uh, sorry dockyards in, in Gdansk. And uh, I thought this is uh, this is good because they really do things like this. Sometimes they get money to do this. Uh, they call it site specific shows. So I thought this is not far from reality. And the other you, you talked about the with the blending of the two genres kind of putting the following the story of the British Karmat Club but then having it go into the Greek tragedy format. Um, but it seems like the British Karmat Club is a, a story that does meditate very deeply on the very question brought up by the Greek tragedy. Like we know this is supposed to happen but that seems to be a central theme. Um, and I found the ending very surprising precisely because the, the thrust of the Brothers Karamazov seems to be a judgment, like a very careful judgment that then comes on the end of redemption and the walking away at the end seems to challenge that. And so my question was, was how do you decide to put those two in conversation and if that is, was an intentional use of it or if there was something else with that particular use of the Brothers Karamazov? Well, it was intentional. I was, I was fascinated by the possibility that, that somebody acts after he's influenced by, by a work of art. Either you commit suicide or you, you do something nice or whatever, but, but it can be a result of both life and the, the show you've just seen. You know, 
I was fascinated by that possibility that art influencing life and life influencing art. So, and I know it's uh, could be maybe I did it in a rather simple way, but uh, but that's how we did it. Yes. Music and yeah, yeah. Scenes interact. I originally wanted to have a, a Russian composer, but he was a very weird guy and he wouldn't leave Moscow and it was difficult to talk to him and, and to arrange anything with him. And uh, and the Poles is this is a Czech Polish co production co production and the Poles insisted that we have uh, so called Polish elements, they called it. They, they insisted we have as, as much Polish arti artists and, uh, and that language and all that. So I said, okay, if you have, if you need Polish elements, so give me a famous Polish composer like Kaczmarek, for instance, uh, Jan Kaczmarek. And I thought we would never be able to get him. And they said, okay, no problem. And then I had a meeting with Jan Kaczmarek, who before that he got an Oscar for uh, for uh, the Finding the Neverland. So he was really really famous by them, and, uh, and he said, yes, I'll, I'll do it, and we recorded music in, in, in Los Angeles and uh, with, with a small orchestra. And I gave, him, I gave him about 30 notes for 30 places in the film where I would imagine there might be some music and, and why and what sort of music, and sometimes he respected that, sometimes no. But, uh, the, the problem with, with this film is that they talk nonstop. So the problem is how, how do you use and what sort of music you use. It needs to be a powerful music, but it has to go well with the dialogue. So that was the technical problem, and, uh, and I think he solved it beautifully. And, uh, and the soundtrack was never published. You know, it's, it's bizarre. You know. But uh, yeah, so that's the story of the soundtrack. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a friend of mine, and he, he's a great puppet uh, puppeteer, and uh, and I thought we have to we have to try to express ourselves in in many different ways. So if it's if it's a festival on Dostoevsky, so there would be things like that. And then I thought, well, if it, if it was a theater show, there would be an interval in, somewhere in the middle of the of the play. There would be a sort of interval. So I I use this like intermission, so I, I use this show as a sort of intermission in the film. And, uh, and the question was, can we afford to go away from the story for two minutes? And I think we could. You know. And it's, uh, so it's, it's a breather, you know, it's, uh, it takes you out for, for a minute or two and then you're, you're thrown back. And we, did, we, we tried various things with, the, with this guy. Uh, we tried a, 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 a hedgehog, or he, he, he does uh, funny things. But uh, this uh, this Dostoevsky worked best, and he did Italian version. This was uh, this was uh, Slo uh, Slo uh, yes, Slo Slovenian. We're pl we're playing with uh, we're playing with languages also, but you don't recognize it because it's all Slavonic languages. So your movie has a very dark feel to it. It's set indoors. It's not a lot of natural sunlight. Except you shot the scene with uh, Smerdyakov and Ivan outside when he's talking. What was? Why did you choose to shoot that scene outside in, in sunlight? I'm just curious. Well, it's again, we we knew we have to have a certain rhythm and, and change the scenery. Even in a film like this, you have to plan the scenery or plan the rhythm and and be inside and outside because you would get would be too much. So once we did the recce and the recce's and decided to, to choose this factory, we were walking around the factory and ass assigning various scenes to, to different places in, in the factory. So that, that was that was the really a, a funny part of the preparation. And uh, then we were measuring these dialogues whether <coughs> they can actually say that much while walking from here to there. And, uh, and not as simple as that. But that seems to be that doesn't seem to be much more of a linchpin to the film because when 
the actors came out of the theatrical space were continuing the play, right, after he had seemingly had this quote unquote real life interaction with the young man whose son died, you really blurred the boundary there between the two narratives that were going on simultaneously. I mean, there had to have been more to it than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is that the factory worker is not present with this scene, so he sort of misses this scene, but you don't miss the scene because you, you can see it. The play gets bigger than what what the factory worker can see himself. That's that's right. The audience in the factory doesn't get to see all the scenes. Right, which is an implication that there's a greater audience for that. No, it's an implication that or, or maybe, or for me, it's an implication that that they that the the play spilled out into 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 reality or into much much bigger space than than the whole. It's like when when they gather in the in the dressing room and he's crying in in there in the showers, and they say, "Let's rehearse quickly the that scene," and they quickly go through another scene. These two guys, Alyosha and, and the Kapitan Snegirov, and uh, and they rehearse it just quickly, just for the sake the sake of words. That's that's the same example, you know. So the actors are using time. Once they get into the re rehearsal mood, they're using this time to rehearse. And it's it's very much like uh, in reality, you know. It's the actors when when you do. We, we call it we call it uh, sometimes we do rehearsals when uh, in September in September after the after the summer break you know we do rehearsals to refresh the show and we do it partly on stage but partly off stage and of course there's no audience for these rehearsals but it's for for the actors to remember what what was going on so. Where, where you you fell out of this rhythm or out of that stylization of, of the film when, when they walked out or when they left that space? I'm actually having a, a little bit of a hard time rem remembering which conversation happened directly before that. So Smedjikov was waiting outside the um, factory for Ivan to walk by, but Ivan had just been talking to, help me out here. To the, to, uh, to the Pope. Okay, so yeah, was that? The guy? Polish guy, and, and they were talking the reality, the real dialogue about the history of the factory. He walks out, and Smeljakov goes on with the play. So right before that was the, was the real dialogue. Right, well, I guess that was just more of a challenge as a, as a viewer, because the scene that you just referred to, when the two guys decide we're waiting here for this Mm -hmm. you know, pause anyway, let's go through a scene, um, that seems more, I don't know, natural in a rehearsal setting than the way, even though it was outside the theatrical space per se, Smerdikov was staged there, right? He was waiting for Ivan to walk by, so it just seemed just very coincidental that he, that Ivan had been talking to the real pole, and mm -hmm. then suddenly they just into uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, performance for seemingly no one because there's no one there, right? And it was just interesting because even though it was rehearsal within the factory, there was always viewers that we were seeing. Okay, right? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it just, I mean, that one, that are you, are you, And you thought, well, whom are they performing for? Yeah. Right. And, I mean, there was no, you know, kind of sign for me as a viewer that, oh, okay, let's go through the scene, and that it was narratively in place with what was going on, I don't know, that seemed to be, to be a very mm -hmm. crucial scene in terms of the listing <coughs> of the fiction, quote-unquote, and reality, quote-unquote. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm.
Well, yeah, it wasn't my decision. I, I, I was using the, uh, the dramatization of somebody else, the, the show that they play. Uh, it, it was dramatized by, by a guy called Eval Chorm in 1977. So they're using this text. And uh, in that text, Zosima is already uh, non-existent. So, and I, I think it's it's a it's a good decision because it's almost impossible to play a saint or somebody with such big moral authority. Once once you personalize this by an actor, it becomes funny immediately. Or or you have to devote a lot of time building this character of, of such a guy, and the only way to build it is by other people adoring him or trusting him or, or praying. So so you would need a lot of screen time to, to do that. And then uh, the only result is uh, the influence it ha his, uh, his death has on Alyosha, because he leaves monastery partly because uh, this guy died. And, uh, and we don't treat Alyosha as, as the main character of as the Protestantsky Alyosha is, is the main character for us. No, for us, uh, all these four characters are more or less equal. So, so that's why. So why, why do I want? Why are you trying to summarize what the book for us? Like, um, why, 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 um, like, what do you think about what at least? What do you think about what Toyevsky is trying to tell us from the book? Why, why do you write a book about faith? About reaching all this without uh, knowing a meaning of life? Or yeah, well, it, it, yeah, you can pick several things from, or many things from Dostoevsky. For, for me, the most interesting thing is, is, of course, freedom, question of freedom. And if, if you're free, are you free to wish somebody's death? No. Is, is freedom about this? That's, that's one important question. The other question is, uh, are you responsible uh, for stupid people acting in your name? You know, that's, a, that's a very modern question, I think. You know, these, these questions I'm interested in. But uh, you, can, you can choose many things from Dostoevsky, and, uh, and all of them are fascinating. But uh, as I said, this, uh, this adaptation was done by, by a different guy who's no longer with us. He died in 1989, and he was a great Czech uh, director, film and, and theater director. And he did that adaptation, and this troupe, this theater group, really plays this play, or has been playing this play for 10 years. So, so I was partly capturing them. I didn't have to bother with the rewriting Brothers Karamazov from, from the book into the, into the drama. It was already done. I just shortened the drama and put some new elements in it. But I was, was mainly interested in what it's like to play Dostoevsky. Because it's difficult to, to do the adaptation of Brothers Karamazov. It's almost impossible. So, so I said, oh, let's forget about this. Because there, there's going to be so many things missing that uh, you're never going to please the audience by giving it a proper adaptation. So it's rather focus on the actors. And uh, you were right. You know, it's, 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 it's a, it shows that I, I like actors, and it's, it's, a, it's an homage to actors, basically. Can you say something about the humoristic elements of it? I mean, um, you know, in some ways, if I told someone, I just watched a movie about a Czech troupe playing a Russian film in a Polish abandoned factory, 
know, it sounds like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I found some humor in, in it. When, when, I, when I watched the show the, in theater, I, I laughed many times, you know, so I tried to keep, I tried to keep some, some of the funny parts. I don't know if it, if it was funny. I wasn't, wasn't here all the time, but, uh, but well, actually... I was thinking of more the kind of the post-Soviet humoristic little jibes, the, you know, but that was you. I mean, that wasn't Dostoevsky, like, not knowing who Valenza was and... Oh, that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, for me, actors are clowns, you know, they're, they're civil life, they're like kids, you know, they're, they're like children, you know, they don't know anything, they don't speak any languages, and that's true, you know, they, uh, they don't know what they promised to anybody, so they, uh, they're living like wild animals sometimes, you know, and, and still, they come up stage, and they act like gods, you know, and, and you believe, him, believe them 100%, so that's the... That's the change, you know, changing from irresponsible idiot into somebody who says great lines and, and says them in such a way that you believe them. That's, uh, so that, that I'm always fascinated with that. You know. So I always try trying to make them make a couple make them a couple of clowns there and and, and have them grow serious at the end. Mm -hmm. in the factory, I mean, that was another interesting... But that's a fact, that's a fact. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Can you talk to, a little bit about casting? Uh, are they real theater, theater actors or are they are prop actors, film actors? <laughs> uh, well, in Czech Republic, everybody does everything, so all the actors do both film and television and theater and dubbing and and uh, <clears throat> and train departures. So they, they do everything, you know. So that's why they are so busy. And I, I've kept the I've kept the cast from the play. I changed the girls, and I've put some more characters in it. But the the core is the same as 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 in the play. The family is the same. So there wasn't the cast casting wasn't difficult really. Tell us actually a little bit more about the actors. The, the fellow who played Fyodor, for example, I could see him playing Lear. He's an extraordinary actor. What else does he do? Well, he's he's the major f film actor, Czech actor. Yeah, he's like he's a star. Well, in there you would we would have three stars, three four of them, are real stars. Yeah, they're not unknown actors. Yeah. They're still doing theater and prop. Yeah, yeah. They're still doing the play. <laughs> Once a month. You know. Can I ask a quick question about actors? Um, how did you come across Mustalash, uh, the guy who plays the father? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's not exactly a star. He's not exactly somebody who is recognizable, but he's very strongly associated with movies of Lech Majewski. Uh, I've seen him. I've seen him in Zmuš uh, and I've seen him in in Vesele, in, in the in the new Vesele. He's, he's he's yeah, he's playing a cop there. I've seen him in, in two films, and and I think his face is is perfect. And uh, yeah, we we needed somebody who would. Uh, well, the Czech audience doesn't know him at all, which. Which is good because they think it's it's an ordinary person, maybe from the factory. The Poles, of course, know his face; they know of him, although he's not that famous. But uh, but I needed an actor, you know, and 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 a very good one because to pretend that you are not an actor, you have to be a really good one. So and he he was actually he, he was the most expensive guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, he was like a triple the. the the, the price of, of the Czech lead. Yeah. But he deserved it, you know. I'm sorry for the for the for the Polish girl, she's not Polish. She she is Polish but she spent twenty years in Germany, so speaks with an accent. Yeah, she speaks with an accent. Yeah. I was going to ask, can you call us a little bit into the 
the play of languages there that you alluded to earlier, especially for Sustainus, with Baku writing out of the heteroglossy and bringing all the, the languages and the, the artists together. Tell us a bit about how you were playing with that here. Yeah, well, uh, well we pretend that effective workers could understand something from the play, so they, they should understand a bit of Czech. Well, the Czechs don't speak any Polish, so that's the, that's one level why like Czechs being ignorant to anything around them. Uh, well, the Poles, the big nation, speaks the language of the small nation also, and uh, and, I, and I and I simply enjoyed the mixture of, of languages. You know. So that was also the, the question of the melody of the voices and all that. And it's true, you know, when, when the Czech audience, when they sometimes uh, uh, load it from, uh, from the internet without the titles, and they complain on the internet, uh, well, there were no titles, you know, in the film. <laughs> we couldn't understand the bloody Polish. You know. <laughs> Pirates. <you know. laughs> so we're educating Czech pirates you know, in other languages. Why the ballet? The same, same like the puppet, you know. You need a break from, from the heavy talking. But isn't that funny? It's not funny, no. It's, it's, it's a different way of expressing maybe Dostoevsky, maybe something else. It's just an interlude, you know. And I thought we could afford it. The one that that's uh, that that hurts his finger, her fingers. Yeah, yeah. she's an she's an actor. She comes there with the director in the car. She's giving him a finger at the beginning. Well, the, my idea was that she's she's an, an actress in the show, <coughs> and her part was drastically cut down. And she probably uh, she was the the girlfriend of the director, but they split up or something like that. You know. So she comes to the comes a couple of hundred kilometers to say a couple of lines. And she's repeating the, the scenes that are no, no longer there in the, in the play. Well, in, in, in Dostoevsky, this is a big part. You know. This is Lisa, uh, who Alyosha fell in love with. And that's one of the reasons why he leaves monastery at the end. But it's, yeah, you cannot develop all the characters. So you have to find excuses why, why they're so slim. Thank you very much. Yeah. I thank you.